The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, uh, hi everyone. Uh, good afternoon. I hope you're all doing well and staying safe. Uh, it is with great pleasure that I'm here today to participate in the opening of today's webinar, uh, Foresight and Futures Thinking, Scenario Development in a Time of Crisis, with our dear expert trainer, Dr. Morne Moster. Uh, my name is Vladko, and I'm an international training consultant at Viron Professional Development Institute. I am the event manager for this webinar, and I will be present to ensure that everything runs smoothly. So if you have any questions, do not hesitate to contact me. Uh, before we start, I would like to introduce you to our dear expert trainer, Dr. Mornay Muster. I'm pleased to announce that Dr. Mornay is one of our leading experts at Leoron, and his main area of expertise is in leadership recognition and decision making, including systems thinking, future thinking, strategic thinking, design thinking, creative innovation thinking, change thinking, and related thinking competencies for leaders. He has an extensive global experience over 20 years as faculty manager and consultant. Uh, if you have any questions during this webinar, uh, please write them down in the questions section located in the control panel. And we will have a Q&A session uh, right by the end of the webinar and we will answer uh, all the questions. And also, uh, I would like to remind you that uh, the webinar will be recorded and it will be available on our YouTube channel the following day. Uh, so you can uh, check uh, again if you have to revisit anything and share it with friends and colleagues, of course. Uh, and after attending, uh, each of you will receive a certificate of, of attendance on your email. So in one hour, there will be a follow-up email and you will receive it uh, right there. Okay, thank you all for uh, listening and I wish you an informative session ahead. And Dr. Mornet, the floor is all yours. Thank you so much, uh, Blacko, for that lovely introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for joining us for this exciting session. Some of you I know joined me last week as we were looking at the intricacies of leadership in a difficult time like a crisis. And so this afternoon, we're taking a different perspective. We're looking at foresight and futures thinking, specifically scenario development, and even more specifically, in a time of crisis, the time we're all facing today. So we're going to spend some time looking at some principles of foresight and futures thinking. And then I'm going to uh, explain a scenario development process using a very practical case study. My suggestion to you, is to sit back and relax, look at some of the science behind foresight and futures thinking and the principles for scenario development, and have a think about what that might mean for your organization and the kind of decisions that you're making in a time like today. Now, why is foresight and futures thinking so important? Well, um, as director of the Institute for Futures Research, um, one of the leading futures uh, research institutes in the world, I'm pleased to tell you that for strategic decision making, for strategic decision making, consideration of the future, of course, is absolutely critical. One of the interesting things we're going to explore is how does time, and specifically the time of the future, have an impact in the way that we make decisions? Is it possible for us to say anything about the future? Is there any way to peer through the veil of uncertainty that lies beyond the immediate future. So I'll share some principles, I'll share a scenario development process, there are various processes, and I'll do that by using a very practical example. And then if there's any time left over, I'll give you a sort of highlight of some of the trends that we think you can expect after the COVID crisis. Some of you may know that um, the work I'm going to share with you this afternoon um, much of that appeared in this book, Managing Organizations During the COVID-19 Crisis. Now, you may be surprised to see a book already out about this topic. And I must tell you, it's been out for about three to four weeks. It was one of the first books in the world to appear on this topic and was put together by bringing uh, a whole host of uh, leading thought leaders uh, together to explore the intricacies and what the complexity of the crisis might mean 
for managing organizations. And my work in this book is specifically about foresight and futures thinking. Uh, you may also know that uh, there's been an enormous amount of media interest in the research work that we did on foresight, including in television, in the newspapers, and a number of other platforms. Let's take a little bit of a step back and, and simply say uh, that there is an enormous amount of scientific evidence that proves what many of you perhaps have thought to be true for a long time. And here's an example of a journal article from Technological Forecasting and Social Change that proves simply this thesis. Organizations that study the future outperform organizations that don't study the future. You'd think this would be a very obvious assumption. But as it turns out, very few organizations have a very diligent, robust process for investigating the future. Many organizations, I'm sure you will recognize this practice, simply look at the spreadsheet, they look at what's been going up and down for the last two, three years in their P&Ls, and they make a decision essentially based on a projection from the numbers. That is not a science of the future. That, dear colleagues, I'll challenge you to think about the idea that that is perhaps the science of the past. Foresight and future thinking, of course, is concerned mainly with one thing, and that is what hasn't happened yet. What is yet to occur? What are we yet about to discover? So this study, just for, for example, was of listed organizations over a seven year period, so a longitudinal analysis, and found simply that organizations that are so-called vigilant of the future consistently in practical financial terms outperform organizations that don't study the future. So how could one go about doing that? Well, um, I alluded to this idea very briefly in my previous uh, presentation, but uh, just to re repeat in this uh, important context that our general rule of thumb for leaders, and most of our work, uh, I should say, uh, is with senior people, typically in large organizations, and we've done this work uh, through uh, the exciting um, network that Learon provide in various places in the world, in, um, in uh, not only in the UAE, but Jordan, Kuwait, um, Abu Dhabi, Dubai, uh, Saudi Arabia, but also in Western Europe, in Paris, in London, in various places in Africa, um, and the like. Now, our rule of thumb for senior decision makers is that um, you could benefit from this uh, idea that we call 20, 30, 50. It's a rule of thumb, a general indicator to senior decision makers in large organizations for how they could and indeed should spend their intellectual energy. And the general rule of thumb there is that you spend about, should spend about 20% of your intellectual energy on the past. I'll talk a little bit about what that means for the study of the future then about 30% of your intellectual energy on the present, it's what's happening today, and at least 50% of your intellectual energy on the future. What hasn't happened yet? Now, what a crisis does to this ratio is a very interesting idea. Essentially what it does is it reduces in its typical response the time we spend thinking about the future and we become consumed with the present. And that ratio becomes something like 10, 85 and five. So what a crisis does to the mind is really fascinating. It makes the cages come down, makes us build walls around our minds. And of course we do that practically with lockdown, but we also do that intellectually when we're facing a crisis. And so the standard response in a crisis, unfortunately, is that thinking about the future suffers when, in fact, in a crisis, the exact opposite is required. Now, more than ever, a careful consideration of the future is essential. So think about your organization when you're making decisions. If you're a senior leader in a large organization, how much of your time are you spending on the past? Think about those 
trend analyses of the last five, 10 years. How much are you spending on the present? And how much are you spending on the future? As futurists, and I'll repeat this idea several times this afternoon, our view is that every risk and every opportunity lies in the future. And that's why the study of the future is absolutely essential for senior executives. Let me speak very briefly about uh, the philosophy of futures that I'll share with you. Um, a few basic principles. The first very important principle is that more than one future is always possible. In other words, multiple futures are possible. Why is that so important? Well, it turns out all of us have the temptation to think of the future as one thing. I'm sure you've had conversations with your friends like these, where they tell you the future of the world is going to be all about tablets, or all about the internet, or all about Donald Trump, or all about Brexit, or all about the dot-com boom, or the dot-com bust, uh, or the Berlin Wall, or the moon landing, or whatever we thought at the time was going to be the one thing that would determine the future. This is a very important idea. Today, more than one future is always possible. That's a liberating idea, because what that tells us is that we are not victims of the future. The future is not just something that must be survived. The future, in fact, dear colleagues, is something that must be designed. More than one future always possible. The next principle is that the seeds of multiple futures already exist today. In other words, if we just look closely, we look at what we call dots on the horizon, weak signals from far away, and we look at what's already going on around us, we will discover that the seeds of many futures exist already in the status quo. It's in fact a truism for most futurists that we argue that the future is in a sense already here. It's just not evenly distributed. So many futures possible. They all um, have their seeds in today. And what that means is that there is a spectrum of possibility in the future. The future is not one thing. In fact, what often happens as the future unfolds is that a spectrum of possibilities, a menu of possibilities is presented. Let me give you a practical example. Think about when human beings discovered, let's say, the bicycle. You could sort of joke a little bit tongue in cheek and say, well, that must be surely the end of human walking. Why would anyone walk again when we have the bicycle? Well, as it turns out, walking is now an Olympic sport and we have the bicycle as well. We discover the motorbike. We'd say, surely that is the end of the bicycle. Why would anyone pedal if they can just use the internal combustion engine? As you all know, the bicycle is now a bigger industry than at any time in human history. Let's say we discover the car after that. What happens to motorbikes? Well, of course they don't disappear. What happens is a spectrum of transport possibilities begins to emerge and really, the tough question for executives is where will you play? We understand, of course, we accept that the future and investigating the future is a complex matter. So we are not crystal ball gazers. We don't pretend it's driven by one or two factors. It is in fact multifactorial and we have a deep respect for the complexity involved. That's in fact one of the reasons that we don't make simple little predictions. Perhaps just uh, to talk about two broad schools in the investigation of the future, and one way to think about that is on the left there, a kind of quantitative school, which is really uh, all about the numbers. Uh, it's essentially about projecting numbers of the past and the present in an attempt to study the future. It uh, attempts to make very quantitative based predictive analyses the approach that I'll share with you this afternoon leans a little bit more towards the right there, uh, intractable problems, difficult problems, complexity driven problems, problems that are opaque, in other words, very difficult to peer through. Uh, 
So we're not going to talk simply about predictive analysis of numbers in spreadsheets. We're going to look at intractable, flexible, fluid, opaque problem types. Um, so let's uh, get into then um, this idea of time frames that I mentioned before. And here's a very simplified way in which we could start to think about the future. Most of us think about the future something like this. There is a past and there is a present in which we are today. And then at some distant point, there'll be something called the future. Now, I refer here to futures thinking because our interest is particularly in the thought process for senior leaders. And that's because decision-making for senior people is so important. Why is that relevant? Well, of course, as you become more senior, the scope of your decision making expands in two very important ways. One, the impact begins to expand in terms of the sheer numbers of people that you influence. Think about it. If you're a worker on the factory floor, you may impact yourself and maybe a colleague or two and the tools that you use. But if you're an executive, you're impacting thousands of people working at your organization, thousands, sometimes hundreds of thousands of people in your broader ecosystem, including your shareholders, your investors um, uh, in various forms, your suppliers, your staff, your customers, and so, so. Future thinking is a very valuable tool to consider the future implications of decision-making for those thousands and thousands of people that will be influenced by your decision-making. And here is a temporal perspective, in other words, a time-based perspective. So let's just look at it a little bit carefully. Well, one of the interesting things about this kind of temporal or time-based perspective is, when is a decision made? Well, um, it's perhaps, obvious, but interesting once you start thinking about it, that a decision is always made in the present. Even if you made that decision yesterday, well, it was the present yesterday. If you make it tomorrow, it will be the present then. So at the time of the decision making, you're always in the present. Now, why is that important? Well, the present comes with a lot of intellectual noise. There is an enormous amount of detail that bombards you on a daily basis. Most of us now are even fatigued with the kind of information overload that we face, let alone what we're confronted by when we consider the media, social media, and so on. So always made in the present with the enormous concomitant risk of the noise of the day. Now, what do we use as the foundation for that decision making? Where does that foundation come from? Well, for most of us, that is the past. I make a decision in the present on data essentially from the past. So this is already interesting because it starts to suggest that there may be a little bit of a disconnect between the time in which I'm making the decision and the time where I'm getting the data for making that decision. Now, the past, as I've already illustrated, is not irrelevant for futurists. And I've given you the rule of thumb of 20, 30, 50. And so it is important that we take into consideration the past. But we should understand that the past, of course, is not the future. And so this becomes really fascinating when you're making a decision in the present. You're basing that decision on the past, but you're making that decision for the future. It starts to mess with the way that you think about what a good decision is. Now, one of the interesting things that we often consider is um, what we call the current future. If you just look at the middle to the right there, the current future. And the current future is essentially the idea that if I behave the way I keep behaving today, that will give me a certain dispensation, a certain set of circumstances, a certain set of conditions in the future, the current future. Keep behaving the way I'm behaving today. That gives me a certain kind of future. But very often that current future, of course, 
comes from the past. And it's true that the past has, in a way, shaped today. And the current future is the idea that if I were to perpetuate the ideas of the past and perpetuate the kind of behaviors my company and my executive team exhibit today, if I perpetuate that, that gives me a future dispensation that is essentially based on projecting behaviors from today. Well, you might say, well, what's wrong with that? Well, there are a few dilemmas with that. The first dilemma is, are you attracted to the current future? Is the current future something that is appealing to you? In other words, if you lose the same talent and keep doing so that you're doing today, if you're losing high value customers continuously, is that the kind of future that you want? If people are disinvesting from your organization or you're struggling to access finance, is that the kind of future that you'd like? So the current future is not always the same as the preferred future. In other words, the future that we would rather have. The current future is what I'm doing today, simply extrapolated into the future, right? So if I have too many kilojoules every day, and certainly during lockdown, I've had far too many of them, but if I keep behaving like that, my current future uh, becomes, in my silly example, uh, rather undesirable. I'm gaining vast amounts of weight. Um, so that current future has its origins, its roots, of course, in the present, and those decisions have their roots in the past. And in that past, we are very interested as futurists in studying the past, but we do so in a very specific way. We do so uh, in particular based on this acronym known as OPACH. And I'll talk you very briefly through what we're interested in. When we as futurists look at the past, we do so with a very specific lens. And the first thing that we examine there is the O. And that O is for origins, origins. In other words, where did this come from? It turns out that origins don't just disappear overnight, they linger. And you can apply that idea to anything. Think about where you come from, where you were born. Think about your nationality. It may be true that because you're such a senior educated person, you may have transcended much of the characteristics of that nationality. But for most people, elements of that nationality will still be in their identity profile. You can apply that to a country or to a sports team or to uh, uh, a business team, even to a family or even your own individual identity. It's important, therefore, as futurists to understand the origins of things. They'll explain a lot about what's likely to disappear and what's likely to be reinvented. The P there is for patterns. In other words, as futurists, when we do study the past, 20% of our intellectual energy, we look for the things that happen again and again and again. The way we typically treat high value customers or low value customers, premium customers, talented people, underperforming people, new customers, shareholders, and so on. What are those typical patterns of behavior that we exhibit? Especially when things go wrong, what do we do then? The A is for attitude. This has an awful lot to do with our thinking and our mindset. Many of you would have heard futurists talk about paradigms, those intellectual attitudes and patterns of thought that we use again and again for decision making. The T is for traditions. What do we celebrate? What do we hold as important? How do we, um, how do we perform our rituals? What's traditional here in our organization? But also, what's traditional in our decision making process? The C is for culture. That's just the way we do things around here. And all of you who've worked in more than one organization will know that organizations have their own unique culture and that influences decision-making. And the H there is for habits. Those things, very interestingly, that we do without thinking. Now, for someone like me who studies the art of thinking, a habit is particularly important because if a habit is something you do without thinking, well, what then is a thinking habit? Well, that's an instance of a time where you think you're thinking, but you're not really thinking. It's just a thinking habit. It's outdated thinking. So 
as futurists, we study the past with this opaque lens, origins, patterns, attitudes, traditions, cultures, and habits. And having made sense of the past, we then have a careful consideration of the present. And in that present, we study the present in a very specific, scientifically disciplined way, which is essentially governed by the idea that we look far, in other words, far beyond the boundaries, the horizons of our own organization, and we look wide. In other words, we look beyond our own discipline. We refer to it as a transdisciplinary contextual scan. A scan of the context, the environment, in such a way that we can transcend our own disciplines. We look far also, as I illustrated, for those dots on the horizon, those early signs, perhaps, that things are about to change. Then we do explore the current future, and then we ask, is that a future that we find desirable? Is that what we really want? And there are a few ways, then, that you can think about this. Um, if the current future is, in fact, not what you want, in terms of the kind of success that you aim for, whether in terms of security or status or a sense of community or financial profit or reduced anxiety or um, you know, less effort and more reward or whatever that desirable future might be. The current future is not that. You can think about that future then in some alternative ways. In other words, we're not destined to end up in the current future. Alternative futures are always possible. So what we do is we start to examine what we call explorative futures. In other words, simply an investigation and exploration of what is possible. What is possible? And the reality is that more than one explorative future is always possible. More than one is always possible. In fact, quite a few may be possible. So if that's the landscape of what's possible, well, what we think about then is, what is it that we want from those futures? If that's what is likely to happen in our sector, our industry, our national economy, our region, the GCC, internationally, globally, uh, technological-wise, or whatever the driver might be, what is it that we want? And there are a few ways to think about the future that we want. We call those normative futures. So if you're sticking with me here, making decisions in the present, investigating the past in a very specific way, studying the present in a transdisciplinary way, looking at the current future, the thing that we think uh, will happen based on repeated behavior of today, and then exploring more than one future that we call explorative futures, and then the futures we want, the futures we call normative futures. And there are a few ways in which you can do that. The first way is to um, is to think about those explorative futures and then think what you want if each one of those were to play out. So if this one, if E1 plays out, what do I want then? If two plays out, what do I want? If three plays out and so on. That's one way to think about your normative, uh, about your normative futures. A second way of doing that is to think about the explorative future that you would prefer. In other words, if you argue, for example, that, um, that, that those uh, explorative futures are not all equally attractive, and perhaps having looked at your normative futures in each one, you realize perhaps that one of those explorative futures is more preferable, a preferable explorative um, future, then, um, then the idea is to start maneuvering the world in such a way that your preferred explorative future plays out so that you would be better positioned if it were to happen. But it, there's also a third possibility here, which is to, if you find yourself in a situation where none of the current explorative futures uh, is satisfactory to you, and if you have enough money and a, enough status and enough influence and enough passion and charisma and energy and time to create perhaps um, an entirely different future. 
And there have been high innovation, highly creative organizations around the world that have been successful in producing something entirely new. And we also know that there are companies in the GCC uh, that are doing exactly that. So there's just um, battle, really complex, but, but still rather um, simplified version of how one might go about thinking about the role of the present, the past, the multiple futures explorative, the multiple methods normative for the kind of future that we desire. Okay, okay. So I'm going, what I'm going to do next is just talk a little bit about scenarios um, and, and just say one or two words about scenarios and then give you a very practical um, kind of example. I should say at the onset here that the purpose of scenarios is not entirely and sometimes uh, not at all about prediction. Scenarios don't aim to predict the future. What they aim to do is to paint a number of possible futures. And based on the visualization of multiple possible futures, in other words, the moment that senior executives have seen that more than one future is possible, they then come back to today and say, well, okay, given these scenarios, what does that mean for the kind of decisions that we need to make? So the approach that I'll be discussing with you uh, is one that is qualitative, not quantitative. In other words, as I suggested earlier, not simply the projection of numbers from a spreadsheet, uh, but much more narrative informed. We try to tell compelling stories of the future. There's a big debate in the futures world about which one is more attractive. The, the reality is they both have merit, but what we find with qualitative futures is that it allows for a much more creative, innovative, fluid interpretation of the future, whereas a, a mere quantitative projection um, uh, is, is, is sometimes appealing because it seems so precise. But uh, it is exactly the reason why we think that it, it is often deeply flawed. It is, is claim to preciseness. So it will be qualitative, narrative informed. It will be um, very much based on interpretation of the future and informed by a sense making process, a uh, process by which we look at multiple, multiple uh, actors, multiple influences, and try to find the connections between them. It'll be non-predictional, as I've uh, suggested before, and non-projectional, I think I've made that point. Um, we understand in the scenarios that we develop that uh, they are multi-level. In other words, you can do that at various levels, at an operational problem level in a business unit, but it can also be um, in a, um, a separate business unit level or at an uh, enterprise level. And um, what's grown enormously in the last 10 years is at a national level where national governments have in fact set about to produce long-term future views on the uh, both explorative futures of their regions and the normative futures that they would like for their country, often referred to as national development plans. So multi-level, multi-agent, that's important, in other words, more than one agent will always uh, more than one agent will always be involved in the development of the scenario and those agents have so-called agency in other words they're active role players that can make decisions we are appreciative of multi-narrative what we mean by that is that everyone's got a story right everyone has a view and we try to gather as many of those views as we can we call that multiple partial views in the complexity theory and we're not we're not in other words taking only one single story we're not, as we say in research, indentures. We haven't made up our minds before we've looked at the future. We look at the future first, and then we make decisions. Uh, the next principle there is that we accept that the future is emergent. In other words, it's not predetermined. It emerges, and here's an important uh, element to remember, perhaps, of this afternoon session. The future emerges at the intersection of the drivers of that future. And I'll give you a practical example of where we've done a national example. Uh, the next principle is that uh, our scenarios are, 
are developed uh, for strategy purposes. So for higher order decision making, for strategic level executives to have a much more informed competitive strategy, that's really why we do this. And so our view is that the future is design based, in other words, subject to design, not just something that we have to react to. And uh, it is furthermore probabilistic, in other words, government governed by probability. When you do pure futures work, People can sometimes say, well, they don't dabble in probability because that blinds you to, uh, to various futures. But in our corporate uh, futures work, probability is essential because corporate decision makers have to make real decisions with real problems. But very importantly, it's not deterministic. In other words, no guarantees, but that doesn't mean probability isn't relevant. So, let me share with you then uh, a scenario set that we developed um, for uh, at a national level, and it was for uh, for South Africa. And I'll talk you through the process. The process is really more important than the content. So my suggestion to you is to think about the method that we used rather than the content. Um, uh, the, the element contained within the method. The method is much more important than the content. So, at the, at the onset here, we wanted to examine the, the post-COVID situation for a country like South Africa, as an example also of a developing economy. And so we thought, who are the main actors in this drama that is about to uh, unfold? And the decision was that we're going to look at the behavior of two very important agents here. On the one hand, the behavior of, uh, of human beings. In other words, the question was, how will human beings behave? Um, the orange man from across the pond is, is just an example there. How will human beings behave? And how will the virus behave? And this last question, how will the virus behave, I think was a particularly interesting, useful contribution to the development of scenarios, which um, have been used now at a national level uh, in South Africa. How will the humans behave? How will the virus behave? So we gave the virus a, a sense of agency. In other words, we allowed it to, to almost make its own decisions. And when these two connect, humans and virus, that starts to produce some really fascinating scenarios. So um, let's have a look. When we um, then looked at the social uh, dimension, um, uh, particularly in developing economies, we felt that it was important to recognize that there are both structural elements to the behavior as well as uh, behavioral or agency-based elements um, to how they're going to behave. In other words, what we're saying is um, the structural components is the kind of the, the architecture of the society, and the behavioral components is those elements that people can choose. And so we recognize both. We recognize that there are some constraints in terms of the structure, whether it's infrastructure or legislation, but there are also elements where people can simply make up their minds. It's not illegal to behave in a certain way, they will simply choose. And so when we then looked at in the South African context, and this is just a case study approach we're using, of course, it's not about South Africa, it's just an example. Um, but just to give you an example then, on the structural side, um, think about the requirements for social distancing during a time like Corona. And what we wanted to get to is how likely is it that people are going to comply. When you look at things structurally, and you see, for example, major crises in the public transport system, that tells you that it's very unlikely that because such a large percentage of the population is dependent on public transport, and that public transport cannot allow uh, for social distancing, it's very unlikely that because of structural reasons that they will comply. Here's another example. This is from the South African government's uh, own data. Um, for some of you, this may come as a, as a shock uh, to discover that 
a country like this, which is in the top 30 largest economies in the world, has a statistic like this, but less than half of citizens of this country uh, have water in their houses. They have to get water from outside the house, and that means communal water. So these are just two examples of the structural elements of the society. And those structural elements start to suggest to us that certain behavior is more likely than other behavior. And I hope you're beginning to understand how we are unlocking the future, how we're beginning to look through the veil of the future. By looking at structural components, we can already start to see that certain kinds of behavior is more probable than others. So that's on the structural side of the social dimension. Let's look at the agency side, the decisions uh, that people make. Well, in a country like South Africa, already considered to be one of, or if not the protest capital of the world, lots of protests happening all of the time, uh, lots of drunk driving. So you can see that when it comes to the kind of choices that the society makes, not always the healthiest choices. And so when you combine the structural elements with the behavioral elements, that starts to indicate some of the probable behavior from how these humans are likely to behave in a crisis. So you can uh, then integrate these dimensions in simple uh, kind of diagrams like these. You can compile an expert panel, and that's a really important dimension of producing scenarios. Scenarios, uh, we often say a little bit tongue in cheek, is a team sport. Scenario is not something that you develop on your own. You need to have a group of interesting people with different perspectives around you. And so in doing that, you can then think about the structural dimensions, think about the behavioral dimensions. And in our example of scenarios here, the structural dimensions indicates low levels of compliance and the behavioral dimensions and patterns, origins, patterns, attitudes, traditions, and cultures illustrate equally uh, low probability of compliance to health protocols and lockdown protocols. Okay, so that's on the human side. That's on the social side. Let's look at the virus. Now, I must tell you, and I say this very proudly, that we did this work uh, about two months ago. So this was long before this language became popular language in the media. And your friends who, uh, who used to be constitutional experts on Facebook um, suddenly became epidemiology experts. Um, this was done way before uh, all of that popularization of the language. So we said we're going to look at the behavior of the virus in four elements. So we're going to look at um, the transmissibility or infectivity of the virus, the so-called R0. In other words, how many people are likely to be infected by, uh, by each person? How infective is this virus? And it turns out this is a very difficult thing to, uh, to answer. And we can see many governments around the world um, you know, got this horribly wrong. And we would argue simply because they, they haven't uh, reflected on the scenarios in the way that I'm proposing here. So how transmissible or infective is it? Turns out it has an awful lot to do with comorbidities and uh, with age profile. Um, the second element we looked at is if you do get it, how serious is it? What's the level of morbidity, in other words, the level of severity? Even if it is quite morbid and severe, how lethal is it? What is the likely mortality rate? And it turns out all of these dimensions are actually quite confusing. And far too many politicians, of course, um, didn't do their homework, didn't follow the science, followed their gut and embarrassed themselves in their long-term decision-making. And that had very significant global economic consequences. And we can perhaps discuss that a little bit towards the end. And then finally, the mutation rate or viral adaptability and resistance of the virus. In other words, how able is this virus to adapt? So if you think about the common flu virus, you know, remarkably uh, adaptable. We still don't know that mutation rate. So we factored those four dimensions into um, uh, some kind of uh, singular uh, variable and then try to come up with an idea of the, the potential viral virulency that we're dealing with here. And if you uh, then uh, look at the behavior of that virus and um, you look at infectivity and lethality, what we're always interested in is 
what is the future of this thing? So to use a Latin question, quo vadis virus, where are you going virus? And here's the very interesting, likely evolutionary path of a virus. What a virus likes to do is that it prefers to become more infective. It wants to make sure that transmissibility increases. That's because it wants to jump from one host to another. But what's really interesting is that the natural evolution, evolutionary path of the virus is in fact towards lower lethality. And the reason for that is unsurprising. It doesn't want to kill off its host. Otherwise, it's essentially committing suicide. So the likely future path of a virus in its evolution is somewhere there towards higher infectivity, but lower lethality. Okay, so we've looked at the social dimension. What will the humans do? And we've looked at structural and we've looked at uh, agency based or behavioral elements. Then we've asked, well, what will the virus do? And we've looked at a number of variables there, including infectivity, uh, morbidity, lethality, and mutation. And now we try to intersect the behavior. So this is, if you get nothing else from this afternoon, this is really the crux of it. Having looked at some of the key drivers, what happens when these drivers intersect? What kind of scenarios might emerge then? So of course, very difficult to start anywhere, but um, having made a decision around our vantage points, we looked then, as I've suggested, at social compliance. And you can do the same in your society, wherever you are in the world. Um, and we know that we have people from all over the world attending this session. So here we ask, what is the probability of social compliance to health regulations and so-called lockdown regulations? Is it high? Is it moderate? Is it low? Or is it virtually non-existent? How likely is the society to comply? And already, when you look at uh, what informs that, in our case, structural and behavioral component, you could start to say, well, the, the likelihood of social compliance in this context is sort of moderate to low. Okay. But now, what about the intersection? We looked, as I suggested, at viral virulency. And what we argued is we're dealing with something that's, of course, more virulent than the common cold, even more virulent than the flu, but not at the same time, not quite as virulent as the Black Plague or as Ebola or other diseases. It's, it kind of has a, a moderate virulence. And so just with that simple interaction, having done, of course, the enormous amount of pre-work, you can start to see there are four scenarios here with high compliance and low virulency, low compliance and low virulency, high compliance and high virulency, and high virulency and low compliance. And based on this, we can already start to see that the most probable scenario for this country that we looked at um, is that scenario here, sort of fairly low, low to moderate compliance, as advised by the expert panel, and looking at the science, a sort of moderate to high viral virulency, certainly not extreme. But that, of course, um, gives us only part of the answer and makes for a bit of a lightweight scenario set. So what we do next, and this is an important step, is we try to enrich the narrative with some of the other key drivers that will shape the future of this thing. And so the next dimension that we introduced is what we called government enforcement. And in developing economies, uh, in, in open democratic developing, econom uh, developing economies, it is typically the case that um, government enactment, government implementation, is unfortunately not always where it could be or where it should be. Despite the fact that in a case like South Africa, for example, at a policy level, it's usually world class. So some really top class thinkers. But when it comes to implementation, it often collapses. And so you can see what's starting to happen now. Suddenly we've moved from four scenarios 
two eight scenarios. I won't read through all of them, but you can see that you could have a scenario with high compliance, high government enactment, and low viral virulence. But in the same way, you could have high compliance, low government enforcement, and low viral virulency. And I'm sure you're beginning to see the enormous complexity here. So in each one of these quadrants, you then have two scenarios. That gives us eight scenarios already. But where's the most probable scenario? We've already said for the country we're studying here, fairly low to moderate compliance, moderately high viral virulency, and sort of moderate to low government enforcement. So it's it turns out we're we're heading somewhere here. Um, if I can just get the um, Never mind. Uh, so we're heading somewhere here. We're heading towards that. And what's really interesting about scenarios is that uh, we can already see that one of these eight scenarios is already starting to emerge as the most probable among the eight. It's also possible, of course, to keep enriching the narrative. And what we did in this instance is to look at the driver of health system responsiveness. And now you can see the scenario set almost explodes. And suddenly we have 16 scenarios. So you could have, for example, a situation of high social compliance, high government enforcement, high health system responsiveness, and low viral virulency, which will be extremely different from, let's say, a scenario of low virulency, low enforcement, low health system responsiveness and low compliance. So where are we in terms of the most probable scenario in the case study that I'm sharing with you here this afternoon? We already know low to moderate compliance, moderate to high viral virulency, moderate to low government enforcement. Now the health system. In the case study I'm sharing with you, in the South African case study, Already before COVID, the health system was absolutely on its knees. So what is the probability that the health system will now suddenly become a world-class agile system? Well, it turns out that's difficult to answer because in this particular case study economy, it really is a world of two economies. A third world economy with a hyper-fragile government health system. But at the same time, world-class private health care, world-class university systems of health care, fantastic research institutions, including specifically for epidemiology. And so a very interesting thing starts to happen. What started to look like the worst case scenario is somehow re remediated by the idea that it turns out the health system responsiveness, while not ideal by any stretch of the imagination, has the potential to be not quite as low as we thought in the typical public sector. And so an interesting, most probable scenario starts to emerge as government also supports its own enactment by bringing in the military suddenly government enforcement rises a little bit. Because of the factors I've mentioned, health system responsiveness starts to rise a little bit. As viral virulency starts to taper off, especially in this case study that I'm sharing with you now, where we have, by the way, less than 2% mortality of all infections, despite the fact that we have a low to moderate level of social compliance. Okay. But now we can enrich the diagram even further. And so what we often look for is what we call archetypes in the scenario set process. And three of the archetypes I'm going to look at in this case study I'm sharing with you this afternoon are the following. The first are what we call wild cards. Wild cards are those elements in your scenario set that despite your best laid plans of mice and men, as John Steinbeck said, um, despite your best laid plans, they come from the side and they just disrupt things. And in this particular economy, 
One of those wild cards is the labor union. This economy has a very, very well developed uh, labor union um, activism in the, in the country. And in fact, the government of the day is in a formal alliance with one of the largest trade unions in the country. And so we said even two months ago that as we get towards the latter stages of COVID, labor unions will start to make their voices heard. And that's exactly what we're starting to see today. And we still think they have this power to be a wild card, to disrupt things, despite some of the early signs of optimism in the country. The next, cap, the next uh, uh, archetype that we looked for is what we call the moderator. Some agency in the society that could calm things down and also a catalyst, in other words, something that could catalyze, that could enhance some of the really healthy characteristics of the situation. And what we found in this, in, in this economy is that the media played very much uh, an important role. We have an open, free, independent, and bold media with an increasing capacity for investigative journalism. And so the quality of reporting really calmed down psychological sentiments around chaos and was in fact very scientifically informed and linked to the idea of science, which is why I mentioned them together in that icon there. And by the way, we often use icons in scenarios because of there are so many ideas present, you have to find a technique of helping people to understand everything. One of the other moderator catalysts we found was this enormously powerful, very sophisticated higher education sector. Very well established uh, research protocols, high quality uh, medical education and research institution, including specifically in epidemiology. And then finally, my personal favorites, since I work with, uh, with business, we were curious about an integrator, something that could bring all of this together. And in this particular context, um, business played a very interesting role. The history in this case study is that the relationship between business and government is actually quite shocking. In fact, based on the Global Talent Competitiveness Index in this economy, out of 101, 119 countries, South Africa is 101, so really quite disastrous. But business comes to the party, starts to do some fascinating work on philanthropy, makes funds available to small businesses, really quite against the expectation, supports the government's funding around uh, recovery from COVID. And what we have seen now, uh, just in the last 24 hours, is that one of the first studies, formal scientific studies, on a vaccine against the coronavirus is happening inside this economy. Isn't the future just absolutely fascinating to study? So if you do get the vaccine, it might very well come from this scenario set that I'm explaining to you this afternoon in this particular case study of South Africa. So when you stand back from the scenario set, what's really fascinating is that at the onset of Corona in this particular case study, both the general population and the financial markets assumed that the most probable scenario for this case study is also going to be the worst case scenario, what we call the dystopian scenario. But because of these uh, moderators, catalysts, and integrators, and the ability of government to some degree to work with strong policy, harness some of the resources, work together in a private-public partnership in the health system, ensure a slightly higher than likely level of compliance and control the virus with some frequent testing uh, and moderating, we have a scenario that's by no means ideal, but is most certainly not the worst case scenario. Why is that so important? Because decisions are based on our view of what is the most probable. So if we make a mistake on what is the most probable, you might, for example, disinvest from the securities exchange in South Africa based on the idea that everything will collapse. 
and then you'll invest in what you think is a consistent market like the United States, when in fact the exact opposite might happen. So, futures thinking and scenario development has a very practical implication on the shaping of your future, even in very practical and financial terms. So, I'm going to pause there, uh, Vlatko, and I have a, a, a set of um, sort of emerging trends that I could share with the audience if, if they have an appetite. But perhaps I'm just going to allow the audience to, to make some comments on um, some of the principles of futures thinking and specifically the scenario method case study that I shared this afternoon. And Vladko, if you could, uh, perhaps you could share some of the comments that um, some of our guests have. I see we have 114 people here, which is quite astonishing, isn't it? Yeah, well, we do have some questions. Uh, I can oh. go through them now. Okay, so we have a question from Shireen here. Uh, we built our goals in 2020 in different situations. Now our future isn't clear with its economical and social aspects. How do we understand what is the best plan now? Yes, um, I mean, I, it depends on when that question was asked sort of during the presentation, but uh, there is no magic bullet. And it, it's, a, it's a great question, of course, to ask. Uh, there is no magic bullet. And, and what futures thinking offers as a methodology is to explore, as you can see here from this diagram, multiple possible futures and then make the decision. So my answer to your question is the worst thing that you can do is to make a knee-jerk reaction to the crisis or to think it's going to be just business as usual. The thing to do is develop a set of scenarios first and then from that set of scenarios, make sure that your decisions are based on those scenarios rather than simply based on an overreaction to the present. All right, now uh, we have another question. Uh, Nakhla, are there any limitations on the development of scenarios? How do you decide these are enough scenarios? Yeah, well, that's a lovely question. Um, you know, the I only have a sort of tongue-in-cheek answer for that, and that's sort of when you run out of time and energy and money. Um, but the, the, the real answer is that uh, one of the great limitations that we uh, often study is the limitations of your own mind. And that's why we often start with, with issues of paradigms. Paradigms are, are typical repeated patterns of thought. That's really what a paradigm is. It's a pattern of thought. And so Patterns of thought are often, in our experience, one of the biggest limitations to scenarios because they prevent you from seeing what is possible. You know, Blanco, what's really fascinating is if you look at the last um, global financial crisis, so many of the companies that all of us engage with today on a day-to-day -day basis were hatched during or around the global financial crisis. Now, you'd think, wow, that's amazing. While the whole world was crying, some innovators were reinventing the future. And I find that absolutely fascinating. So how you look at the world, your paradigm, I would say, is one of the most important drivers and perhaps limitations um, and risks on the one hand, but also one of the greatest opportunities when thinking about what future is possible. Okay, uh, what are the main keys uh, to build more accurate and effective foresight? Yes, that's a, that's a lovely question. Um, what informs that? We would say that having done the, the work on some paradigms and thinking about where they're limited, we would say a combination perhaps of the, of the narrative approach, which is what I shared here this afternoon, and the quantitative approach is important as a second dimension. And then thirdly, I would say the quality of an expert panel is particularly important here. In other words, when you think about, uh, let's say in our case study here, uh, when we think about 
compliance and virulency in government enforcement and health system responsiveness and wild cards, moderators, catalysts and integrators, it's useful to have a panel of experts that present a wide spectrum of views. When you look at some of the governments around the world who have made horrible mistakes in the management of COVID, for example, one of the things that you can see is they've, they've either had a single economic lens or they've had a single medical lens or they've had a single ideological lens. And so a critical key to answer this important question is to have a, a panel of experts that advise you and help you to develop scenarios that present a whole host of perspectives, a sort of holistic uh, group of panelists that will help you to pick up on some of the nuances when you're developing your scenarios. Otherwise, you develop a single story of the future, and that means you're very likely to be wrong. Uh, how do I act this understanding about the potential foresight future in order to developments in digital sites, especially in the current global crisis, COVID-19? I'm sorry, Vladko, there, there was just a little interruption there uh, to the quality of the line. Would you mind repeating that? Yeah. Uh, how do I access understanding about the potential foresight future in order to developments uh, in digital site, especially at the current global crisis, COVID-19? Yes, yes. I, I think uh, if I understand the question correctly, there are two elements here. So how could I do it? Well, methodologically, uh, we use it with a method known as systems thinking. And that includes things like studying knock-on effects, ripple effects. In other words, not just the next level of effect, but also the second order, third order effect, and so on. So, so systems thinking and system dynamics as a methodology could be uh, very useful in doing that. But then particularly in terms of digitization, I think uh, that question raises some very, very uh, important ideas. And I'm, I'm gonna mention something about that in the trends that we'll get to uh, after we've taken another two or three questions. Okay. Uh, could, could the foresight and future thinking scenarios help in preparing for a crisis? Undoubtedly so. In fact, we are now working with a number of agencies, cross-continent agencies, uh, that are looking at the development of so-called early warning systems. And those early warning systems can be applied for pandemics, but they can also be applied for things like uh, natural disasters floods or droughts or typhoons, or, you know, any, any number of, um, of elements that may threaten uh, the, the uh, stability of a society. So the development of scenarios help you then to think about indicators that start to suggest the probability of one scenario over another. And by developing a sensor network, which can be done uh, linking it to the previous question, uh, which can be done in a digital way, it might be possible not necessarily to prevent such an instance, but certainly to start to anticipate, there's a very important word for us as futurists, to start to anticipate the probability of a certain event and then to organize yourself around it. It's really based on the sort of old idea of forewarned is forearmed. You know, if you, the, the, the main reason that companies engage with us is that they want to think about two important things. They want to think about risk and they want to think about opportunity and they want to see the risk coming. Think about driving your car. If, you, if you're driving at night and the other car and you haven't got your lights on and you can't see what's going on, well, your risk suddenly goes up. And what future thinking simply does is it, it casts the lights a little bit into the darkness. You can't see perfectly. We're not predictors of the future, but you can see where the road is likely to go a little bit and that reduces your risk. And then the second thing about opportunity is that by looking at the dots on the horizon and connecting some of those dots, you can start to see some of those opportunities that are just peering out from over the horizon. And if you can access some of those opportunities faster than your competitor can, well, then you're an earlier mover and, um, and you're much more associated with the latest ideas. And so that's the, that's the real value of doing this kind of work better strategic decision-making 
for reducing risk and accessing opportunity because of your increased ability to anticipate. Maybe one or two more, Vadko, and then I'll go on to some of the trends. Okay. Uh, how can a paradigm be transparent? Gosh, yeah. <laughs> um, some tough questions this afternoon, Vadko. Uh, some uh, <laughs> some really challenging, uh, really challenging, highly conceptual questions. Um, how can a paradigm be transparent? It's a it's a great question because, of course, as the the questioner is implying, and I completely agree with the implication of the questions, paradigms are hidden. You don't know. You're sitting around the boardroom table, people from different cultures, different nationalities, you're making decisions, you can't see the paradigm. And so what we do practically is we have a, uh, we start with a simple list of paradigms that have to do with how we define things, where we think things come from, uh, how we uh, decide what valid knowledge is, a whole sort of host of these paradigms. And then we make them transparent by sharing them with each other. Let me give you a stupid practical example. Uh, one of the paradigms we look at is uh, what we call the ontological paradigm, which is just academic language for how do you define something. And um, what we do is we help teams, strategic teams, to make obvious what they mean by that. So for example, let me give you an example of a recent client we worked with. They ran a, 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 a turnaround strategy based on a project um, that they called, and, and many of you will have heard about this, called Back to Basics, Back to Basics. And the CEO kept go, you know, getting up in front of uh, staff and saying, staff, you know, we're, we're excited to do this, and we're going back to basics. Yes, everyone in the company agrees, back to basics, that's the way to do it. Basics, that's the thing to do. So what we did, and it didn't work, it didn't work. And so what we did is we, we came in and we started with paradigms and the ontological paradigm says, well, um, how do you define things? So we got into the room and uh, the CEO said, well, you know, we're doing this back to basics program. We said, that's fantastic. Um, can we start with the paradigms? Uh, just a question, what are the basics? How do you define it? And the CEO got very angry. He says, you know, this company has been here for a long time. We're very professional. We know what we're doing. Everyone knows the basics. They're the basics. Everyone knows them. Yeah, that's absolutely fantastic. But we are scientists of the future. Let's do a little experiment. So we hand out a little sheet of paper to everyone in the room. And we say, ladies and gentlemen, please, can you record on the sheet of paper the basics? And then we collected them. Well, you can perhaps guess what we discovered. We found that there are so many basics, it's an overwhelming list of basics. And suddenly what the CEO realized is that what he thought he was saying when getting up in front of the whole company, the basics, actually meant something different to everybody there. And there's just a practical example in a response to that question, how do I make a uh, paradigm visible, I think was the, or, or salient or obvious, um, that's one of the ways we do it. We simply work towards consensus by working through a number of paradigms. One of the others we often work with is called epistemology, uh, epistemological paradigm, which is simply, uh, how do you know? It tries to answer the question, how do you know? And it's, it sounds like a really very challenging question. So in another company we worked with, uh, they were losing a lot of high value customers. Um, but every time the CEO got up, he said, you know, we're very customer centric. And so what we did is we started with paradigms and we said, how do you know? It's a very challenging question, right? How do you know you're customer centric? And it turned out in their instance, they didn't know. And so that led to a project that they, they used to start to define customer centricity and the behavior of staff all across the company. So, so that's the way we do it. We ask what seems to be a very stupid question about paradigms, normally about things like definition or how do you know? And we make those perceptions obvious. And when we do, when you do that in front of others, suddenly you start to realize whether there is consensus or not. But I have to say, it also takes a little bit of maturity from the leadership team to do this. Thank you very much, Bernard. Uh, since we have multiple futures 
how we know uh, that our decision is the best one made with less risk, uh, more customer satisfaction, et cetera. I've got bad news. You don't know, you never know, but there are ways to get closer and further. Let me give a very practical example. Let me give a very practical example. Um, let's say that, you, um, that you've that you developed, let's keep it simple for now. Let's say that we've developed uh, four scenarios like this, right? You've got one, two, three, four scenarios. What you could do is you could write a little one page, even a half a page on each scenario. You say, what would it look like if, you know, in our little case study, if virulency was low and compliance was high, or it was low and low, or low and high, or high and high, and you send that to an expert panel and you ask them to, to vote. So you get a number of people, you get sociologists, you get anthropologists, you get accountants, you get economists, you change people, any of your government people, private sector people, you send them these scenarios and you ask them to vote on their relative probability. Some will say they think this one, some will say that one, some will say this one and so on. And so on the consensus of the expert panel, you may then conclude that most people are arguing somewhere in this region is the most probable scenario. And so a decision that's based on the most probable scenario has the highest probability of being the correct decision. Whereas a decision based on the least probable scenario has the least probability of being the correct decision. Of course, there are no guarantees. The future is not a precise, exact science, but you can reduce the risk dramatically by basing the decisions on the most probable scenario vector. Maybe one more and then I'll, I'll do some I'll do some trends. Yeah, thank you. Um, actually, we have uh, two more uh, short ones, I believe. Um, who should be working okay, on, on, on foresight, foresighting the future? And uh, what is the scenario planning role in strategic foresight? Yes, so was the first question, who should work on it? Yes, that's right, in an organization. Right. Um, so who should work on it? Um, I think the reality is that it is the it is it is the work of senior people. Um, it doesn't have to be the executive committee, but it is typically the, the work of the, the exco and the board. Unfortunately, we know that there's a lot of temptation to look at really short term results. And certainly one of the behaviors of boards that we've observed over the last few years is that they that compliance has become so important that foresight has taken a little bit of a backseat. But think about it. If your money is invested in a company, wouldn't you want that organization to look into the future? And so our view is that um, in the not too distant future, foresight practices will become part of good governance and not looking into the future will in fact be considered bad governance. Now, how can it be related to strategic thinking? As you heard in the introduction, strategic thinking is one of the other uh, bits of work I do with Leron and various companies all around the world. What's the connection? Normally we say that the connection is that strategic thinking must be informed by futures thinking. In other words, you think about the future first, then you make your strategic decision. Think about it like this. Let's say we decide strategically we're going to, it's just a silly example, but we're going to fly to a country and we're going to live there for three months. Now, what we could do is we could just sit in our meeting and decide what are we going to wear and what are we going to eat? But you can see it's very different. If I fly to Saudi Arabia, the weather is gonna be very different from if I fly to Iceland. So what we're saying is, do the futures work first? In your mind, fly to Saudi Arabia first and then fly to, fly to Iceland and then you've seen the future. Then you can come back and start with strategic decision-making. Otherwise, the strategic decision-making is really kind of blind to the future. 
We're making decisions, as we say in our science, we're making decisions despite the future. What you'd rather do is make decisions based on the future. And so the question, the implication of the question is very well founded. Strategic thinking and future thinking go hand in hand. We do a lot of rigor with strategic decision making, but we always advise that that must be done in the context of futures thinking. Maybe we can just finish the question, Vlad, I think we are sort of quite late in the session, but let's see how many more we have. Uh, we have one more uh, just now. Uh, how do we decide uh, the number of scenarios? Uh, it is possible that one overlook one scenario that might be the most suitable one. So how can we know how he, she covered them all, or most at least? Yes, the, the, the best way that, um, that, that we found of doing that is to use an expert panel to rate the probability of, of the relative scenarios. So if you look at these 16 scenarios here, the, the one way to do it is to get an expert panel, give them the list of scenarios, and ask them to rate practically the order of probability of these scenarios. And then we call it a, it's a sort of Delphi. You can then do a second round. So you have 16, you get the responses back. You say, okay, we're gonna take the top eight, send the top eight back to the expert panel. It takes them five minutes or maybe a day, depending on the complexity. They rate from one to eight in terms of probable. You get the back, you take the top four, send it back to them, rate one to four. And so in that way, you're refining and refining and refining all the time what you think the most probable scenario is. And because you're making use of an expert panel, not just the opinion of one or two people, that reduces your risk enormously. Vladko, if there are no questions, maybe I can spend five or 10 minutes on some trends and then we can wrap it up. Yes, please go ahead. Okay, so, so colleagues, just a few trends and these are just sort of I'm just going to sort of fire away and shoot some trends at you for what we think you can expect uh, after COVID. Uh, just so it'll be, it'll be quite rapid. We call it a bricolage, which is just a sort of a random combination of trends. So just very quickly, in terms of social paradigms, we know that um, when people are in crisis, they have an overreaction. So of course, we're going to see an overreaction in favor of health, including organic food. We know that there'll be a substitution effect because of lockdown, and that means all your customers who are not online customers are going to be looking for alternative suppliers. So beware. We're already seeing a strong spirit of experimentation um, where people start to play with new ideas, new product offerings. Unfortunately, especially in emerging economies around the world, we're expecting increased, not decreased inequality. And the reason for that has to do with access to the internet. We're expecting, unfortunately, uh, lower levels of social cohesion, not higher levels, as people become a little bit nervous of each other. A very exciting one here, the rise of science over ideology, particularly in uh, certain developing economies where ideology has destroyed a lot of the economy. The rise of science uh, is at least uh, one of the possible futures. An internationalization outlook uh, is maybe one of the positive byproducts uh, of this idea because suddenly everyone's had an international perspective on the disease. Unfortunately, and this is a big issue to watch out for, I know that kind of uh, late gen Xs and uh, certainly uh, baby boomers, um, you know, are sometimes a little bit suspicious of this one, but this is a real one, and that is a general social anxiety disorder. Mental illness is going to be a very significant outcome, um, and we think especially among millennials. There's a risk in any crisis of not just pandemic, but infodemics, a, a pandemic of misinformation. I've spoken about health a little bit. Governance is going to be interesting, particularly as we search for more and more certainty. A much stronger investment focus on ESG, environmental, social, and uh, governance. Certainly some cash hoarding. So even companies that did have cash are unlikely to spend them. A heightened risk consciousness and increased uncertainty. And then in terms of generational theory, you've heard of millennials. Well, welcome coronials. 
uh, the first generation in the 350,000 year history of our species to study in this way. And that education system has been asynchronous. In other words, they could learn at any time, not necessarily when the teacher was teaching. So learning and teaching were not necessarily synchronized and they were therefore autodidacts. In other words, they were essentially teaching themselves. Certainly my 12 year old son did exactly that. Um, this, uh, the digital intermediation effect, um, I think is really interesting because we're not seeing each other face to face. I think that has a, a compounding effect on social anxiety. Gig work, um, the idea that people do various bits of work and that are essentially paid for piecework. I think that's a trend that will um, expand. We're seeing a rise in and a reinvention of philanthropy. Certainly we're doing a lot of that at work ourselves. Storytelling, I think, is becoming more important. Let me go on to the next one. As I keep th throwing these at you, I know I'm going very quickly here, um, but just to highlight some trends. Um, we, of course, we've already started to see increased uh, borrowing and higher levels of debt. Uh, that's at an individual level, a sovereign level, and even at a small business level. Um, because of that, we can expect a rise in the power of international finance institutions, the, uh, the IMF, the World Bank Group, uh, the New Development Bank, which is the BRICS Bank, um, many more public-private partnerships, um, the borrowing credit increase uh, we were expecting both in volumes and in bad debts, definitely in the medium term. Um, equity is going to be interesting as um, there's going to be some, uh, some sort of reorganization of, of uh, company equity. A lot of offers for free things, which you have to watch out for, uh, you know, not everything not everything that is free um, is really free. Um, we can definitely expect some consolidation as some of the bigger businesses start to buy out some of the failing smaller enterprises. Um, the rise of alternative funding mechanisms and payment models, um, not only uh, cryptocurrency, but, but also other models like bartering. Certainly some opportunism, and um, we're going to see that in terms of uh, acquisitions, but also we've seen some price gouging companies abusing the fact uh, that they've got a monopoly on a product during a crisis. In terms of value chains, we can expect some hybridization of those value chains, the substitution effect I've mentioned. In growth models, um, of course, because of the rapid digitization, the near, near zero uh, dollar marginal cost of growth through platforms means that uh, growth is certainly not something that's going to stop and uh, certainly movement up and down the value chains, a real revisiting of value chains internationally because of the fear of international value chains. Spoken about unions a little bit. That's the last slide here. Rapid digitization, um, I've, I've mentioned, but this rise of the digital elite, those with access to high speed 24 seven internet that can educate their children, manage their finances, increase their investments, manage and enhance their professional networks, trade online, um, Compare that to those that don't have that, especially in developing economies, and you see a rise in inequality in the world. Um, I know that's, that sounds a little bit negative, but um, the intention is not to be pessimistic. Of course, this rise of tele-everything, driven predominantly by the idea of telemedicine, including telediagnosis, telepsychology, a number of others. Um, the, the risks involved now in tele-governance, we've already seen in our own client base, you know, Someone is uh, taking a nap because he's in lockdown, but he has to sign a, a document that has to go to shareholders at a cutoff date, and suddenly governance is in trouble. The disintermediation through technology, in other words, the fact that if you're a middleman, if that's the only thing you do, you are in real trouble after this lockdown because technology has disintermediated the customer. The rise of science, but also the science of face-to-face. -face. We've never been forced to study the magic of face-to-face -face communication. We've never been deprived of it, and so we're expecting that to rise. A lot of do-it-yourself kind of apps, we're already seeing that. And then the rise, certainly, of big man, sort of strong man government. Um, in the worst shadow form of that, the dictators who may have been standing in the wings, a golden opportunity to show your dictator self and, you know, blame, blame it on corona. Uh, particular nervousness around um, reduced privacy, because of surveillance, not only for your health, but also for your movements. And we're already seeing in China, for example, what's going on there. Um, electronic voting, I think, in government may be relevant. There'll be a certain amount of policy opportunism, 
as governments try to push through a certain ideological policy set um, and hide behind the fact that it's driven by corona and uncertainty. And then perhaps interestingly, uh, ruralization. We've seen urbanization in the last 50 years, but because of the possibility now of remote work, I think we can expect the sale of holiday homes uh, because people don't need uh, or won't need, uh, won't be able to afford those second homes, but it'll be balanced by the fact um, that there'll be a price advantage as people work digitally away from home. And so we can expect a kind of decanting uh, of the overall metropole. And then perhaps an interesting social one, and there I'll end it, uh, the, the, the possibility at least, one future, um, namely the masculinization of the workforce, perhaps except in senior government roles. And the reason for that is simply that in a crisis, people default towards traditional roles. That I'm not proposing this, of course, I'm just suggesting that this is one of the possible futures, that when families have to decide only one of us has a job, um, they might very well um, default towards uh, more traditional roles. And so uh, with those few just um, uh, trends, and I know I've, I've shot them at you uh, at high speed, that go perhaps uh, we can conclude the session there. Yeah, of course. Uh... As I mentioned, the session will be recorded and available on our YouTube channel so they can revisit everything and get better. Okay, so uh, they're all on behalf of Leoron PDI and Dr. Mornet and myself. It has been a grand pleasure to have you today and we are honored uh, that you attended the Foresight and Future Thinking Scenario Development in Time of Crisis webinar. We hope that we have met and even exceeded your expectations and you have gained as much value from this experience as possible. Uh, I would like to mention that Dr. Mornet is scheduled to deliver a program actually next week, a masterclass in leadership thinking, where he will discuss further into these topics and many other uh, ways of thinking. Uh, it's starting next week on Sunday, and I'm pleased to inform that everyone that attended this webinar is eligible for $200 discount that you can utilize for the sake. I will receive more details about this on your emails uh, one, hour, one hour from now, along with the certificates of attendance. And uh, as I can inform you, the session is available on YouTube tomorrow after we upload it. And you just type the Lira Institute in Google in YouTube search bar, and it will be easier to access. Okay, well, uh, that's all for today. Uh, we hope that you have enjoyed the webinar and that our collaboration will not end here. Uh, do not hesitate to contact me if you have any questions. It's my pleasure to assist you. Uh, we have my contact details in an email that you will receive later on. Uh, have a lovely evening ahead and stay safe. Goodbye. Thanks, Vladko. And people can, people can follow us on LinkedIn, of course. They can follow yes, me around and share, share the post. They have been receiving a lot of notifications from us lately. So, yeah, they know us. Thank okay. you. Goodbye, everyone. Have a good night.